Well, good evening, everyone, again. And uh, thank you all for coming. You can continue eating your food, um, but we're going to get started with the program. Before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about our, um, both our small groups and our mission theme for this year, which were coordinated together. A lot of you have been a part of the small groups that have read uh, this book, Living Without Enemies, that Sam and Marcia co-wrote together. Um, and uh, some of you may not have read the book, and that's, that's fine, too, because uh, they're going to share a little bit about their story, so you'll kind of get to experience them tonight anyway. Um, but we have small groups um, that are finishing up now, and we'll start them back up again in the fall. But thank you all for being a part of them, and I hope you've had some great discussion. I look forward to hearing the way that the different small group ideas cross over between each other. Um, also, with our mission theme this year, which is, Who is My Neighbor? Listening, Learning, and Living with Our City. Uh, we are doing a number of initiatives to um, try to understand our city and get to know the, the people, the places, the needs, the, uh, the hopes, the pains of, of Durham. And um, this is, uh, reading the small group book is a part of that theme. And we also have uh, opportunities to get involved in the community. Uh, we have these dinner and discussions that we're at tonight. Uh, we've already had a couple of them. And we'll have them throughout the year where we'll talk about certain topics and we'll um, just have a conversation within the congregation about that. But we're very excited tonight to have uh, Sam Wells and Marsha Owen with us. Thank you all for coming. Let's give them a hand for being here. So what we'll do is um, I'm going to ask them a few questions to share their, um, their story and share about ministry. And then we'll have some time with the, for discussion am amongst the tables. And then we can all ask them some more questions after that. So uh, I want to start with Sam. Um, Yep, you can come on up here. Um, Sam, if you could share with us a little bit about the journey that has led you to, in, in the book you talk about the, these different models for ministry. Um, so if you could share a little bit about what those models are and your journey that has led you to um, having a conviction about those models and, and discussing that. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you. That's a privilege for Marsha and I to be invited into this Glorious company. Um, I will get louder without talking louder. It's a miracle. <laughs> a miracle of Ben. I, uh, the, the, the fourfold model that we talk about in chapter one of the book, and I'll just briefly run through it because I know many people are very familiar with it. Uh, the, the first kind of uh, social engagement we talk about is, is what we call working for where you have the skills, the expertise, and the answers, and the solutions, and you see a community, shall we call it downtown Durham, shall we call it northeast central Durham, uh, and all you see in that community is a set of problems. Uh, and there are two kinds of problems, those uh, that you have the answer to, uh, and they're very lucky to have you around, and those that you don't have the answer to, which you just get cross with and, uh, and, and criticize and say it's hopeless. That's, that's a caricature of the working for model. But before I caricature it too much, I, I, should basically, uh, I should point out that basically every undergraduate who comes to Duke wanting to make the world a better place assumes the working for model. Uh, you go to college, you go to um, a professional school, you become extremely good at doing something, and you spend the rest of your life doing it for people. Uh, that's, that's the way mission in the mainline church in America is generally done. Uh, so that's, that's really the default where the book begins. Uh, the problem is that it's, it's a flawed model. It, it works quite well in a crisis, an earthquake or something like that, where you helicopter experts in. Um, the trouble is that earthquakes don't describe the whole of the human reality. And it's a model that doesn't really work quite so well in a crisis. If you are somebody, all of whose relationships are defined by working for uh, assumptions of, wh of which you're always on the receiving end, then working for really reinforces your humiliation, reinforces your impoverishment. Uh, the second model, if you think of them as like four... Uh, 
windows and a window pane. The second model uh, we call working with. Working with is more like community organizing, where you bring your skills and experience to the table, and so does everybody else, whether they're a homeless person or a family of a murder victim or a police commissioner or a local business person or a university staff member or professor or whatever you might be. You each sit around a table very much like the table you're all sitting at, and you each bring that, that wisdom to the table. Uh, and, he, uh, and there's a place for everybody's wisdom. And, and, and the ideal is that at the end of that, you all get from the experience the satisfaction and in the working for model, only the expert gets. You all bring that together. So to, to, to cite an example we cite in the book, uh, you think of urban ministries in, in downtown Durham. The working for model says what, what the people need who come to urban ministries is an evening meal. Trouble is, if that's all people need, they'll just come back tomorrow and they'll need an evening meal again. The working for model doesn't really have an answer to that, that problem. The working with model involves a homeless person sitting down with a bunch of other people who are concerned about the issue of homelessness in Durham and they all work together uh, to, to address the issue. And, and ideally, uh, the homeless person comes for the first time to urban, minist urban ministries uh, looking for a meal, but before long, they find themselves behind the counter helping to cook the meal, and then they, they're empowered to actually design the menu. And then after five years or so, somebody's worked their way up through that kind of process and they end up running urban ministries. That's, that's how, it, how that sort of model should work in a genuinely working with kind of a way. The third model we call being with, uh, and, and being with also involves spending time with people like working with, but it's, it's not leading with your skills. You don't come into the, uh, into the situation, into the relationship saying, I'm a physician or I'm a dentist. You just come in and you say, I'm, I'm Sam. And you don't come assuming that you're going to be the agent of change with that which that person very much needs. In fact, you don't approach the other person assuming they basically need to change, which really the other models tend to assume. You come because you enjoy simply being with them for their own sake. It's a distinction that goes back to St. Augustine's distinction between what we use and what we enjoy. And this, uh, we enjoy the things that never run out, most typically God, for Augustine really only God. Uh, and we use all those things which do run out and they're ways of getting us to those things that, that, that we enjoy. Well, being with is about learning to enjoy people for their own sake. Uh, we, in the book, we call it treating people as if every day was their birthday. Because on people's birthdays, we enjoy them. And the other 364 days of the year, not so much. <laughs> um, but the birthday, we say, it's your birthday. I'm just here because I want to hang out with you. Uh, and being with is saying, I'm just here because I want to hang out with you. It's not because I can improve you or necessarily because you can improve me. If it's anything, it's certainly the second one. And then the last model is being for. Being for has some of the negative connotations of working for, i.e. you never really get into a conversation with the person themselves about what the issues in life really are. You kind of feel you already know. You don't need to be told. You've read the right books. You've done the right course at college, whatever it might be. But it also has the negative associations of being with compared to working with in the sense that it can sort of feel a little bit passive. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of being for, but there's a lot of being for about. The, the emblem of being for is the blogger. The blogger is the person that knows everything, tells everybody they use the wrong vocabulary about this, that the last movie they went to see was incredibly wrong because it saw it from the wrong point of view. Never in, you know, absolutely the right attitudes about every form of social disadvantage never engages with someone who actually is experiencing social disadvantage themselves, just tells everybody else that they're wrong. Now, that's a caricature. Uh, there, are, there are much better models of being for, but, 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 the, but being for, like working for, doesn't actually ever ask somebody what they think the issues are. So that's the, that's the, 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 four, the, the, the four models. And in the book, uh, we describe how Marsha's experience uh, over the last 20 years involved with issues of gun violence in uh, in Durham, uh, made a journey from a kind of working for assumption of going to Raleigh, 
getting the gun laws changed, a very you know working for way of, of of solving issues, doesn't mean you ever need to meet the family of somebody who's died through homicide because you know what the answers are. You go to Raleigh and you change the laws for people. That's a that's a working for model, classic sort of activist model, uh, and and the, the book describes how Marsha made that journey through working with to to a model I think where she would say that that being with is really the heart of her ministry today. And now you're going to say, how did I make that journey? Yeah, okay, I'll just ask myself the questions. <laughs> Much more time efficient. How did I make that journey? Well, I, I don't think I ever did make that journey because uh, whether it's through laziness, whether it's through selfishness, or whether it's through being English, or some unique combination of the three, uh, I don't think I ever had working for assumptions in quite the same way. Um, and I think it's because I'm basically not a very nice person. What I mean by that is I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not spending very much of my life trying to solve other people's problems. I've got enough problems of my own, thank you very much. Um, and I don't think I've ever been part of a church that has the kind of energy that most American mainline churches have for, um, for addressing these kind of issues. Well, when I say I'm English, I think part of that is we have a thing, don't mention it very loudly, we have a thing called the welfare state. <laughs> the welfare state, it's something that's designed to obliterate the Republican Party and, and blow away the Tea Party and, and smash American politics to smithereens. It doesn't work, but it's a wonderful idea. Uh, so I grew up with the welfare state, which basically says poor people are the government's issue. Uh, and also that churches just don't have the kind of resources that uh, that uh, uh, churches in this country. So, so the whole you know uh, Hurricane Katrina phenomenon, where there's a big natural disaster and we respond by getting in a mini minivan and driving a thousand miles and sorting it out, is was just completely foreign to me when I came here. It happened three weeks after I came, and it was a express education in how American mainline Christianity works. Um, so, but I'm not especially proud of that background. It's just, it's just the difference of my of my background. But what it, I think it does does mean is it didn't occur to me uh, that poverty was something to be kept away from or, or avoided. Quite quite the contrary. The reading of the Testament, uh, the New Testament, I was given when I was grow growing up said it was all about poverty. Um, and Jesus spent his life with a small group small accountable community, you know, a dozen or so people, not a very big church, really. Uh, he spent his life rattling the cage of the authorities, getting in trouble all the time, uh, and he spent his life with the poor. If you look at Mark's gospel, the word for crowd, oklos, is mentioned 37 times in 16 chapters. The poor, the poor, the poor, the poor, the poor, the poor, it's everywhere. You can't miss it if you read the New Testament. Um, and so I wanted to meet Jesus. Uh, I, I spent my teenage years, you know, hanging around waiting to have this fantastic charismatic experience that was going to show me that I could be a Christian forever. Uh, ne it never happened, needless to say. Uh, and so I thought I'd try a different approach. If I wanted to meet Jesus, I wasn't going to sit around for the Holy Spirit to, to just zap me. Maybe I had to get off my backside and go and look. And when I read the New Testament, it said, well, if you want to find Jesus, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to be with the poor. So I say it's because I'm not a very nice person. I didn't, it never really occurred to me that I was spending time with poor people to solve their problems. I was spending time with poor people to solve my problems, which was my problem was when I, want, I wanted to meet Jesus and it wasn't happening. But it started happening when I started following what the New Testament suggests, which is going to where Jesus is to be found. So for me, it's, it's always really been a being with thing. Um, and uh, there are lots of secrets that you can um, pass on or expose when you're just about to leave. Um, and uh, one of the secrets about being the Dean of Duke Chapel is I'd never really worked with students before I came to Duke Chapel. So I was made the chaplain of this big famous university and I never really knew what a student was. I can say that now, I wouldn't have said that in the interview. <coughs> Um, I also don't find students terribly interesting. <laughs> I find human beings interesting, um, and I treat students as human beings, but I don't think there's anything special about being aged between 18 and 22 or something like that. Um, but also, I've never been a very successful pastor. 
I, I wanted to go to churches where which were experiencing social disadvantage, and they were mostly churches where not many people attended. The church that I served for the longest period, six years, up until a couple of years before I came to Duke Chapel, had a congregation of about 15 or 20. Um, and that was a tiny bit smaller than it was when I came. I managed to reduce it a little bit, because <laughs> as most pastors will tell you, it's about weeding out, really, more than it is about, you know, about growing churches. So these are things I didn't say in my interview, but, uh, but, but they're things that, that I think are relevant here because it never really occurred to me that my job was to make enormous church congregations, that, you know, that, that it was all about getting more and more people. I, again, I didn't see that very much in the New Testament. There's moments of it in the book of Acts, but there's not. Um, there's, I, there's, you know, there's plenty of sign. You know, when, when, when I think it was Paul was writing to the Ephesians, um, he was writing to, you know, a dozen people. He was writing to 15, 20 people. He was writing to churches the sort of size of the church I was serving. And that's, that's the Ephesians. Yeah, I mean, that's the Ephesians, you know, the Bible. They got one of the most important letters ever written, those 15 or 20 people. So it didn't ever occur to me that you had to have 3,000 members in order to receive a letter to the Ephesians. Uh, possibly the, quite the contrary. Um, the important thing was that Jesus was there. That was the only thing I really was interested in, and I certainly met Jesus in that in that community. Um, so, I'm selfish. I'm English. I'm used to a welfare model. Uh, I'm, I'm lots of things, but that's why I think uh, being with, to me, was just stating kind of the obvious. And it only I only realized it wasn't obvious when I came here, uh, and I realized just how committed most of the faithful Christians that I was meeting were to what I've described as a working for model. Uh, and, and so how, so I mean, the, the moment when I discovered this, most of all, was when, after I'd been at Duke Chapel for a year, I hired two people to, to um, put forward the, the chapel's ministry in Durham. And uh, we had a service, it was in September 2006, uh, where we commissioned those two people. Uh, and after the service, somebody who was very involved in the life of the chapel, very you know, a, a generous donor and a very faithful servant of the chapel, uh, came up to me and said, Sam, in a kind of confidential man-to-man -man kind of way, said, Sam, you know, I, I think you'll find that the problems of Durham are bigger than you can solve on your own. I thought this was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. But it clearly was completely serious in this man's, because right? he really thought I was trying to solve the problems of Durham. I wanted to say to him, but it sounded a little bit too far, this is about meeting Jesus. I, I didn't say I don't care about the problems of Durham, but this, we're not, this isn't what the chapel's doing for Durham. This is, this is enabling the Holy Spirit for the, to serve the chapel. It's because I don't believe we're going to go to heaven unless we hang out with Jesus. That's why we're doing this. I want to go to heaven. What about you, sunshine? <laughs> or are you happy to settle for solving the problems of Durham? That won't do for me, eternally. It just sh comes up a little bit short. So, in short, I mean, what I wanted to say to him, I didn't, because, you know, I was the pastor, and you don't have these conversations after the service with people who've got any sense. But what I wanted to say to him was, I, I want to be with God, the Holy Trinity, forever. Uh, and if I'm going to get to do that, I want to be with the people the Holy Trinity are hanging out with right now. Uh, and Durham provides fantastic opportunities to do that. I just don't think the chapel has been taking those for quite a long time now. I think it's about time we did. What do you think? That's the conversation I wanted to have with him, but I, I didn't have the courage. I just said, I don't think this is really about solving problems, which was a really cowardly thing to say. And because I didn't say what I should have said, to him, I decided to write a book instead, and Marsha kindly wrote it with me. So, Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Now, yeah, I'm going to move on to Marsha. Marsha, if you would share with us a little bit about your journey into um, having your journey with the coalition in Durham and ministry and into uh, understanding this kind of model for ministry. Sure. So good to, to be here. Thank you. Um, this is where I began. 
uh, as a very small child at Duke Memorial, so it's good to be back. And then we migrated to Epworth United Methodist Church, where I spent my entire childhood and young adult life. And then I left the church. <laughs> um, but I still, as I put it, I still kind of had the burr of John Wesley in my butt. So every time I'd sit down, you know, um, just couldn't, couldn't, seem to, couldn't seem to leave the church. Church wouldn't leave me. And in 19, let's see, 19, in the late 1980s, I came back to Durham after growing up here, going to school here, um, and became a mother. Um, and at that point in my life, everything changed. Um, God came pouring back. Um, there was nothing, there was no um, argument or uh, upset that I could ever find with anything um, when I had my first son. And the love and the, the presence of God was so powerful that I found myself loving all the children. And I know all, and I think that goes for fathers, too. Um, love has no boundaries. And I read the paper every day. And I would read about young boys and men being shot to death in my town. This is the same town I grew up in. And I would talk to my friends. And it was just young deaths just took me into a place of, it was just, it just broke my heart um, as a mother, as a citizen. Um, <clears throat> it was just it, practically incomprehensible. And so when I looked into this problem, what I found was, oh, it's drugs, it's poverty, it's racism, it's this, it's that, it's the other. And I just kept saying, but this has always been here and worse and we didn't have people being shot. So I started gathering with a group of clergy, wonderful, wonderful ministers and laity like myself. I'm not a minister, I'm just a mom. Um, to try to figure out, to discern, I, I think probably what you all are doing right now, what is God calling us to do in response to this suffering? Young people, shot down, losing two people, at least two people, not only the victim, but also the person, if there's an arrest, the person to a life of incarceration. And as we, we responded, or I responded, just in the typical way that Sam described, I was you know, brought up to analyze and act, and that's what I did. We have to change the laws. This is a, you know, a systemic problem. I can take care of this. Um, kind of like a mom, too. Uh, kind of treating my, my brothers and sisters like children. I can take care of this. I'm going to clean up this situation. Um, and in many ways, it, I mean, unfortunately at the time, it, well, nothing ever, we never made any changes. The North Carolina legislature had no interest in doing anything about guns. And I think that we can see that has survived to this day that when it comes to guns and public policy, they just don't seem to mix very well in North Carolina or in this nation. But people kept getting shot, and my heart kept breaking, and so did the ministers of, of, of this town. Um, so we never quit asking, what is God calling us to do about this? Um, because not only could we not pass any laws, the few laws that we did get passed on a local level were preempted by the state of North Carolina. So all the little, the small gains that we had made were taken away. So one day we would meet, and we still do, for 20 years, this group, and I invite every one of you to join us tomorrow. It's the fourth Thursday of every month we gather for a community luncheon. Lunch is provided, it's free. Um, everyone is welcome just to share the peace of Christ, the peace of God. We're an interfaith organization, um, an open organization to all, faithful or not, whether you believe in God or not. Um, 
to see where the peace of God is and say so we were meeting. It was a smaller gathering then. And a young woman said, we should have prayer vigils for the homicide victims. We should go, we should call the families, go to the spot and pray that that is an appropriate, faithful response. And without question, we all agreed. And David Weiner was part of this group. He, at the time, was the executive director of Durham Congregations in Action. And he began organizing it and then handed it over to me. And I've taken it from there. And it was in that experience of having, there's nothing you can do. The person is gone. They've been taken from us in a violent way which to me, I think what broke my heart and spoke to me and to my faith so deeply is that I just kept thinking, they forgot. They forgot that this person was sacred. They forgot that they were sacred. They forgot the most essential point of faith is that we're all in it. Whether we like it or not, we're all in it. We all share the same God. And we are loved and blessed and cherished equally. And so when we began doing that, something shifted. Something very, very profound shifted when I would sit in the living rooms with mothers and brothers and sisters and cousins and fathers and uncles. And there was nothing I could do except share my faith. And that faith is just... It's just a humble, I am here to let you know that your son or your daughter, who was so violently and tragically taken from us, is my sister and my brother too. And if I can do anything, anything at all, I'm here to do that. I'm here to offer you my prayers. I'm here to offer you my life, my resources, to let you know that we are one in God and that I mourn with you. And I remember the first time I said to a family, I was terrified to say, what do you need? Is there anything you need? Anything. And I thought, Lord have mercy, what are they gonna tell me? I need my mortgage paid, I need a new car, I need you know, dinner for 12. Um, um, but every single time, and this remains to this day, what I need are your prayers. And thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. It really meant something that you're not family. But because of your faith, because I, you obviously care for me, and I have not deserved it, um, thank you for coming. Come back. And I started thinking, hmm, that was really pretty amazing. All they wanted and all they thanked me for was my presence. And I thought, you know, that's sort of my relationship with God, that no matter what happens to me, what ultimate insane silliness or, or mistakes I make, always God is present in my life. There seems to be nothing that I can do to stop that. And that's how I wanted to live a life of faith. Um, with those people in my town who I can, I obviously were suffering and suffering from violence, which I think, again, is the most extreme manifestation of our forgetting who we are as children and creations of God. So <clears throat> that went on quite some time. And as, that, it, and as those vigils and those relationships continued and, grew, and, and they grew and multiplied, um, and the sorrow and the suffering that I witnessed, and I d witnessed and do witness, hardened my heart towards offenders. I started making sides. How could anybody do this if they only knew the immeasurable sorrow of losing, of saying goodbye in the morning and then getting a call that you're, and I'm, I'll say son because almost the great majority of people who are killed in Durham are men, young men. 
how could they do that? What person would ever do that and, and, and create this, this just this just the tragedy beyond reason? And then one day we were having a vigil um, over on Carlton Street near the Durham Library and, and Reverend Joe Harvard, there's about 38 ministers who graciously volunteer their time to lead the vigils and they're very casual and everybody is welcome and all you do is show up and know nothing and know that God is present with us. Wherever we go, God is present. And in a situation or a circumstance so tragic as murder, um, God is, you know, touchable. Um, so we were, we were gathering and two young men came down the street. It was, it was dark. And they looked like gangsters. I mean, they were little, you know, I had all my assumptions, all my prejudices, um, went into high gear. And, um, but I left the group and I said, and they said, what are y'all doing? And I know what they were saying is, what are you white people doing? And in a, in a, really in a predominantly black neighborhood. At night on a cold winter's day. And I explained that we were here to mourn, to gather and to mourn and to affirm the truth of God in our lives and in the life of this community. And I invited them to join us, and they did. And Reverend Harvard finished a beautiful prayer. And one of the young men said, this is good. Keep doing it. This is a good thing. And went off. And the woman I was standing next to whispered to me and said, they're coming home from prison. And I, and I thought, I've never met anybody who's been in prison. You know, I lived, I mean, if, they, if anybody was in prison in my family, nobody told me. And they wouldn't have told me either. And I wouldn't have told them either. So anyway, that's kind of the way my family works. Um, but I had never been in a courtroom other than speeding tickets, which I do have a huge history of. Um, but never that kind of you know, a violent crime, and, and it just ne had never known anyone. And that really, that really touched my heart. And then a few weeks later, I got a call. I mean, I read the paper, I still do, and I had seen that there had been a murder, another murder of another young man in Durham. Every, since we've been doing this, I've been paying attention, let me put it that way. It has been about 11, to tw every 11 or 12 days, someone is shot or someone is killed in Durham. I mean, it's just like clockwork. It's an average. I mean, some months you'll have a lot, and then you'll have a lull. But by the end of a, any period you want to count, it's been about every once, every 11 days, someone is killed. And so I read the paper, noticed the death, um, said my prayers, asked for God's guidance, and then got a call from the same woman that was at the vigil and said, that was the man. Did you read the paper? Did you see who died? And I said, I did. And she said, that's the young man who came to that vigil and said, this is good. I think we need to have a vigil for him. And my heart broke open in a way I have never experienced in my life. And the Holy Spirit illuminated something that was so clear and so painful and so true. And that was my, my prejudices, my assumptions, that I had divided the world into offenders and victims. And I had divided the world into many other ways, the rich and the poor. And I saw my poverty. I, I mean, woo, it was painful. It is, still is. Um, and I saw wealth where I had only seen poverty. And I saw the ways that I protect myself and fear people. That just is not godly. It is not what Christ calls me to know, to think, or to do, or to, to live um, and it was, it was, it was a, it was a turning point. And that is when 
God started, began whispering the truth of love, that all I, that we are all gods, that love, sacred love, holy love, is something very, very unique. And it exists in relationship. I don't think I would have ever, ever, ever realized the extent that I do not love if I had not been willing to be in relationship. If I had been home in my house or by myself, you know, people say, love yourself. Well, I can only love myself so much. I, my love grows because others love me. And I am given the gift of being able to love them. That they stay around long enough to let me love them. They don't go run screaming. Um, so that was, that was the beginning of understanding the nature of Christ and God's love. And that is that it exists in relationship, that it exists in equality, that there is this zone where if I dominate you in any way or see you as greater, of more value, I have ceased to love you. I may admire you. I may do whatever you tell me to do. Um, I may want to be like you. But that's not God's love. And if I put me on a pedestal, I cannot love you either. That God's love exists in this holy, unreasonable, practically un knowable or untalkable um, equality and that it lasts in eternity and that there was a peace that was just extraordinary that I realized that what I that I had been measuring and graphing um, and and evaluating that was just totally false that if I do this and this and this I will get this result and I realized this is in my puny, tiny, short lifetime, and I live in the eternity of God. So maybe I should just calm down <laughs> and love. And from that point, and, and seeing that mask sort of drop, thanks, um, thanks to God, we began, we realized that we needed to do um, more for those who were coming home from prison. That, that be, just like that young man, that there are no other, there is not, that we categorize and remove ourselves um, falsely, that we are all equally and, and ch loved by God and cherished by God and blessed by God. And I think that was, and it was being in the homes in, 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 of families that are experiencing the most horrible thing I can ever imagine, that I have seen the deepest faiths and the greatest courage, and the most ethical, and the most moral, and, the, and just the most astounding truth of, of my faith, of, of God, and realized how poor I was and how rich they are. And so we began um, the Reconciliation and Reentry Ministry, which you all have had a, faith, have had a team here, and that, it was wonderful. And um, have and in that journey of being just being with to be present in the lives of people who are coming home expresses those truths of God's love that I'm not that they don't have to succeed that the measure what you measure you do and the faith teams the only measurement that we permit ourselves to discern is faithfulness. Are we being faithful? Is God, do we experience and know and make decisions and reflect the truth of God's presence in our lives, in the life of the team, the life of this community, the life of our lives? And as long as we do that, we're fine. And, that, and to always remember that we really, I, I just, I consider it just radical surrender, that I am not in control, I don't want to be in control, that if someone does go back to prison, it's not over. 
there are no measurable results. One of the most astounding features of love is that it's immeasurable. So why would you start measuring when love is immeasurable? Because it is when we would do those, it, did they do what we asked them to do? Did they make the appointment? Did they see the right, did, you know, that is when there can be domination, which absolutely interrupts and prevents love. And it's just not love because we're measuring it. And so to stay with, and then I get to meet and be in ministry with Sam, who explains it so beautifully as being with. I'm with, we are with one another. It's like friends. I don't expect you to do anything. I'm just going to love you. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be present and watch you. Behold your life. And, and, and be open and willing to enter into it whenever you ask and vice versa. So it is in being with that God's love has just increased. I mean, I can feel my soul grow. I remember I have two sons and my younger son, I guess I'd been involved with reentry ministry, um, oh, I don't know, a couple of years, and uh, we're in our, in our eighth year. And uh, he said, Mom, you've gotten nicer. I know, isn't that kind of a mixed, you know, message sort of? And I, so, of course, my, what do you mean I've gotten nicer? I thought I was always really nice. And he said, no, no, you've gotten nicer since you've been hanging out with, uh, you know, these reentry guys, you know. And, and, I, and I looked at him and I said, you're right, because I get to practice my faith, and that's all I have. I'm not there as a therapist or as a probation officer or any. In any form other than, a, in my case, a United Methodist mom. And as a United Methodist mom, um, I just got to be faithful. And in that, and in leading with my soul, God has graced me with so much peace. And I have learned that the peace of God is so simple. And it is, only, it is when we affirm the dignity of another. That is where we find God. That's peace. And to be able to practice that every day over and over um, has liberated me and released me and shown me my darkest places where God can find, where God's light can find and liberate me and release me and, and let me love. And so... Um, while you discern what is, what this church is going to do in the life of your community, I just hope that you never measure anything and always remember that love is immeasurable and that it is never over, ever, never, and that we can just be at peace with one another, affirming one another's dignity, which has been given by God. Say thank you. Thank you, Marcia. What we'll do now is we all have some, on each of the tables, there are some discussion questions. So uh, we're going to, at each of the tables, discuss these different questions for about five minutes. And then we'll come back and have some Q&A with Sam and Marcia. Um, so maybe if you have one person at the table, be a scribe and just write down some of the ideas that you come up with. And then uh, we'll come back in about five minutes. Now we're going to have a time of uh, Q&A with Sam and Marsha. So um, what we'll do is just raise your hand. And the first hand that I see, I'll come over and I'll give you the mic. And you can ask your question. Wait till I get to you with the mic, because um, we uh, want to make sure that everybody can hear the questions. So does anybody have a question for Sam and Marsha? Uh, I have just been wondering how we would get, how would we know about the vigils uh, by, uh, I went with my husband and se several others to the annual vigil on March the 1st, and uh, that I've noticed there have been five murders in Durham since then, 
and I wondered about vigils, uh, how we would know and uh, about the, that. The Herald Sun, we have a listserv. We do have a coalition listserv, which we um, are very, very careful to use sparingly. And so we, um, it, there, it, that, that list, if you would give us your email, if that would be an okay, or a postcard even, or your address, um, would be for like luncheons and vigils. So that's one way. But the Herald Sun, one of the, our greatest friends in, this, in the vigil ministry are crime reporters, interestingly enough. They are actually our primary way to find the families. Um, and to do, um, oftentimes to do tasks that are unimaginable, but they know through reporting. So the Herald Sun is very, very um, good in that they will put it in notices, that notice of a vigil. So that would be two places to watch the, and there will be a vigil for Timothy McGee um, in May. And tomorrow night, let me invite you all right across the street at the police department well, is this week is National Victims' Rights Week. And once a year, we have a small um, half-mile march, really around your church, <laughs> um, um, with uh, families of uh, homicide victims. And um, beginning at the police department at 7 o'clock, the march begins at 7. And please come. It ta it's, not, it's a very brief um, event, but very, very meaningful. And... It matters, at least I have been told, that it matters to the families that other people have noticed. There is um, one of the greatest tragedies that I see with murder is the isolation of those who are mourning the deaths, the families, that they, people just, um, they do, they, they are isolated. They do not realize unless we tell them that we care and that we are here and that we mourn with them, that their grief is shared. And in that collective grief, um, things happen. I've also had many families say something shifted during that vigil. The fact that we, it wasn't like the funeral. It was different. And um, God was present and things changed. And nobody said a word. Nobody offered any assistance. People just stood silently and humbly together, and people have felt healed, and uh, that, that's, um, that's the truth of God. So I'd love, it. I'll, I should have a sheet. I'll, I'll stand right here and get, and get names and numbers. Oh, yes. Great idea. Thank you. Let's do that too, though. Oh, Let's get the names what a and numbers. Uh, you don't know where I am, but you know, no, let's get no, the names no. and numbers too. Yes, we can do both, <laughs> yeah. but that's right. And our yeah. website is nonviolentdurham.org. One word, nonviolentdurham.org. And, and come to the luncheon too. Our question is what comes after the vigils? Is there another step to take to, to begin relationships with people who are in the community that are grieving? Um, it's just, and it's just so simple. There's, there's no, um, it's just call, calling back, you know, and, and saying, can I drop by? Um, it's kind of what you do <laughs> as a pastor. Um, just, um, hi, you know, and just, you weave it into your life. Um, just wanted to call and Matt come by and give you a hug and, um, because what families will also say is there comes a time, and it's, it's not that far after the murder, that many family members and, and church members, they're, if they're a member of a church, say it's time, it's time to stop crying. It's time, you know. And the beautiful thing of being just um, a humble servant of God is that it's fine to cry with me. You know, that's, that's, there's, that's just beautiful, quite frankly. And um, so, and then over time, one of the most, um, 
I, the, just the starkest um, characteristics of Durham is how extraordinarily segregated we are in so many, in way, in more way. I mean, just you know, very many ways, and and uh, and an enormous amount of mistrust. And so um, it is just in being present with one another that that seems to um, occur because I'm not there to save anybody except maybe myself. And um, I'm certainly not, you know what I mean? There's, I have no agenda. It, I, to call my friends, you know, the, the families, um, it's clear to them that there's nothing that I want, that there is no self-interest. I mean, but that there is a genuine love and that that love certainly comes from a uh, faith. Um, so yeah, that, that's, um, yes, there's, I think, infinite possibilities. I'm wondering to what extent the families of the murderers are included in the vigils. Um, well, that's that's a beautiful, Norma. That's beautiful. Um, we, well, Sam, do you want to talk about a vigil to, to, in how we incorporate that? Well, uh, there's always prayer for. Um, the person, because oftentimes we don't know who did it. Um, there's an enormous, I wish I knew, could tell you with some accuracy, that, but there's many, many, many of the murders in Durham are go unsolved. There's never an arrest. Um, and what, let me just tell you one thing, that before I had um, this, God gave witness to my prejudice, of victim and offender, once that sort of got straight on that, I then started learning from families that they, that they are maybe another family member in prison. And before that, nobody ever shared that. I think that they could tell that I was prejudiced, that I had, an, you know, um, a bias. Um, and so um, I, 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 with the reentry ministry, many of our partners, and I've never done a count, but um, right now I think maybe half of our partners in our ministries have murdered. Um, so we have, does that answer? So we are in relationship, loving relationship with people who have murdered and um, people who have lost loved ones to murder. <clears throat> Thank you. This might be for Sam. Um, the idea of uh, working for somebody or working with somebody, when you have some expertise, when your eight to five job is helping people, um, do we need to separate out that job from our after hours job? Or is there a way of incorporating the being with into helping ministries? Um, ideally, certainly, certainly there is. Uh, I have this phrase that I probably use too often that to, to the person with a hammer in their pocket, everything looks like a nail. And that's my worry about the working for thing is that if you're an engineer and you see Tanzania, you know what Tanzania needs is a lot of wells. No pun intended. Uh, and, and so you go to Tanzania and build wells here, there, and everywhere. And you go back 10 years later and find that no one's used them. And that's because nobody asked for them. They were put in the wrong place for cultural reasons. It was inappropriate. That was a kind of unclean area or something. A woman was allowed, wasn't allowed to go there in the day or whatever the cultural issue was. You never asked because you knew. <laughs> that your skills were just what this community needed. That's my kind of caricature of, uh, of a kind of a, 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 a how our working for can, can get it wrong. And so that can still happen in caring professions, you know, uh, that 
I, you can be a family therapist and you can say, well, here's a situation with a family that's grieving or something. What they need is this thing we did with these people who are coming out of addiction or whatever it might be. And again, we can make the same mistake, however well-intentioned you might be, to say, well, you know, I'm a family therapist, so I've got this skill and here's a situation I'm going to, you know, I'm, 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 it, that's the everything looks like a nail problem, it seems to me. So, I mean, at the risk of sounding blindingly obvious, humility is, is the key to it, really. Uh, in in uh, the can be, uh, I mean, people say to me when I sort of talk like this, they say, well, is there no hope for working for? <laughs> uh, and and I, I always say, if I thought there was the remotest chance anyone would listen to a word I said, I might speak differently. But the whole edifice of the way a place like Duke University and the way most of our mainline churches are organized, that there isn't a chance of anyone listening to a word I say, so I go on saying it. <laughs> um, of course there's a place for bringing your skills. Uh, uh, I, did, I did have a student in the class that I teach at uh, in public, the public policy school, I used to teach, I should say, uh, in the public school as uh, undergraduate class, who, who uh, I talked about these kind of things, and he said, well, it's, um, it's kind of difficult for me because I'm very talented. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have kindly put resources into my education. And um, and I said, didn't, didn't you, I mean, this wasn't a theology or a divinity course, but I said, I knew he was a member of a campus ministry. So I said, you know, don't you think it was quite tricky for Jesus too? <laughs> you know, he, he was really quite talented. A lot of skills. I don't know how many certificates and diplomas he had, but he was very able. Um, I mean, don't you think? He, you know, he was very able, young man. Um, uh, and yet he spent 30 years in Nazareth, you know, before he ever spent three years in Galilee. 30 years being with before he spent three years working with. And then only, a, depending on your theological persuasion, either a week or three days or three hours, working for. Um, so, yes, yeah, for sure, uh, there can be a place in a, in a kind of working with way where you bring your, those skills to the table and, and others and others do the same. Um, but, but I think uh, the, the kind of seeing an area of distress uh, and saying, let me through, I've got the skills, as in kind of let me through, I'm a doctor, kind of is to me that's what I'm anxious about because that's what you do when you see a crowd of people you don't know what's happened inside but you know that because you're a doctor you should be let through and you should be the and you should be there because you're a doctor that's the that's the mindset that I'm I'm concerned about um, it, bring your skills and and wait and wait to be asked is mine I mean, there is, I mean, particularly in the vigil ministry, there is a working for element. You know, somebody comes and they lead the vigil. As, as Marsha said, you know, I don't do that, she says. She brings in some, I mean, there's, there, there's a place for that. But it's only if that's what the family want. So. Unfortunately, that's the end of our time. Um, but we, uh, I don't know how long uh, Sam and Marsha are staying, but perhaps you could catch them on their way out the door and... Oh, they're spending the night. No escaping us now. <laughs> no escaping Marsha's love, no, yeah, as they say. No. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I want to thank you all for coming, and um, thank Sam, let's have a hand for Sam and Marsha for coming and sharing with us. And we are very blessed to have our choir with us tonight to close us out in a song. And so I'd like to invite Bradley Naylor, our music minister, to come up and share a little bit about that song and uh, introduce the choir. So come on over. Well, I think we need to maybe, are we going to move this table? Yes. Yeah, that's great. So I don't mean to displace our guests. <laughs> but you, you'll like our front side more than our back sides, I think. Choir, why don't you come on and filter up? I just wanted to say a few words about this song. Because it's... Its words are so uh, fitting for our evening. So the text of the song, 
This is a piece by Mark Miller, who was a Methodist music minister at a church in New Jersey. Uh, and the text is, is about how we are a circle and wanting to be as wide a circle as we can be. So the text is, draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone, we stand side by side. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song, no one stands alone. So that's the text of our song. I wanted to give it to you so it can be percolating as you listen. I'm Katie Garman, and John Legg and I, as many of you know, are the co-chairs of the Mission Committee this year. And again, we just want to thank you all for being here tonight. We're going to close in prayer. And before that, I'll just say very quickly how much we appreciate um, Sam and Marcia being here. I'm not kidding. As I was driving my children to school this morning, Ellie, who's four, said, Mommy, from the back seat, where is Jesus? And now I think I have better words to answer her question. <laughs> So join me as we close in prayer tonight. One announcement before yeah. we close in prayer. We have, if you haven't read the book and you'd like to, we have oh, books yeah. over here. Uh, they're $10. Um, so if you'd like to purchase a book, then you can uh, just come find me and you can get a book. Or me, if, you, if you can't.
can't do it. Are they signed? Oh, yeah. Are they no, signed? No, they're not signed, but you can get them signed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if you can't get one today, we'll have them at the church for a few more weeks before we return them. So. Okay. All right. So join me as we pray. Dear God, thank you for this fellowship tonight. Thank you for the gift of Marsha and Sam and their presence here with us at Duke Memorial. We pray that you will guide us as we continue to ask, who is my neighbor, listening, learning, and living with our city? Help us as we search for you, God, in the heart of Durham. Teach us to love more deeply and give us hope as we go forth in your name. Amen. <laughs>